We're going to open up our Bibles uh, this evening to Romans chapter number 5. And we'll just get right to the uh, chase this evening. Romans chapter number 5 in your Bible. And uh, that's where we've been, the book of Romans and uh, in the book of Mark on Sundays. And uh, I have preached messages, of course, over three years now here behind this, not this pulpit. This is about two years behind this pulpit, but in this church for quite some time. And I've never preached a message, I don't think, that uh, was more responded to uh, by folks at least letting me know. Um, I know that not always, and I don't seek that. Please don't misunderstand. Uh, I, I do not seek a response as far as from people verbally. I don't, uh, I don't expect people to come out the door and say, Oh, that was a good message. Or, uh, boy, that really, I just don't uh, look for that. Uh, sometimes the most effective messages are the ones that you think you bombed on. And, uh, and, and sometimes somebody will say, hey, boy, that really helped me, preacher. And, and you're like, wow, you know, it's, it's not really about me at all. And it's not. But uh, I've, I've never gotten the response like I did this past Sunday. And I've had folks text, call. Uh, of course, folks uh, said stuff on, on Sunday morning. And and if you have not, if you were not here Sunday morning, I preached a message uh, out of uh, again. It's just the next chapter, next verse. We've been in the book of Mark now for quite some time, and it's on Mark chapter seven, uh, and and we started in verse number one through about verse number uh, twenty, something like that, and uh, on the lures of legalism, and uh, and the deadly lures of legalism. And if you were not in here Sunday morning, uh, then uh, the both services then. Uh, you you need to go back and watch what legalism does. Now, this is what Jesus dealt with. Uh, some people, that they just believe that legalism is adding to salvation. But I believe, uh, and it does, it's works. But I also believe there's a form of legalism that adds to what the Bible says. And uh, it's the Bible plus something. And it's grace plus something. And that is what Jesus dealt with. That's nothing new to the church. That's what Je- There's a lot of preachers that will get up on Sundays and preach their opinion. And they'll put it up there with Scripture. Nothing wrong with giving your opinion, but don't make it Scripture. You know, and uh, I've heard some preachers get up and say, if you don't vote Republican, we're voting you out of the church. Now, where's that in my Bible? And I've heard that said. When it comes around election time, you'll hear all kinds of craziness come from pulpits. And I had one man say, Preacher, why is it that you never mention politics behind the pulpit? Because it has its place. I don't do that here. Because if we're truly a gospel-centered church, we're going to be reaching all kinds. And you let the Holy Spirit of God clean that up, and they'll vote right. You know, you'll look at what somebody's for, and if you say, well, I'm going to face God one day for my vote, I'm not going to vote for someone that condones certain things. According to the Scripture, if it's anti-God, I'm voting for God. And you say, well, preacher, what if both thumbs against God? I'm going to go with the lesser of two evils, I guess, you know. But I think as a citizen of the United States, we have the the, the right to vote. And while we have the right to vote, let's vote. Amen? Or just be quiet about it. But at the same time, I don't preach messages on voting. I don't preach messages on getting out and, and social justice and all that stuff. And though I'm a big advocate for uh, some of the social justice things like adoption and, and, uh, and foster care and uh, those things that are anti-abortion, I'm, a, I'm, I'm dead against an, uh, abortion. Uh, it's murder. And uh, no matter how you twist it and try to justify it, uh, it it's killing a life. Amen? And so I'm, I'm against it because the Bible's it shed innocent blood. And I'm against it. Uh, but I don't think it's the church's job just to go door to door to tell people that abortion is wrong. I think it's the church's duty to go door to door to tell people that Jesus saves. And then when they come to the church, let the Holy Spirit of God clean them up and help them and show them that, hey, killing is wrong. Killing is murder. And all the other things that come with it. And uh, yes, I preach on sin. I do. I preach on sin. But let me just say this. That sometimes we preach, when you hear a message against sin, it's against everybody else's sin, but not our sin. <laughs> Y'all understand? Yeah, bless God, I'll tell you this and that. And you know, you're like, boy, he really got it. But he didn't really hit the ones we're guilty of. Like pride. 
like gossip, like anger. When's the last time you heard a message on pride and anger? Well, that's because everybody's angry and prideful. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, but he tell you what, he hit all that other stuff. Well, I'm sure he did, and that's good, and we need to. But if you'll deal with pride and anger and deal with some of that stuff and gossip and resentment, you'll clean all the other stuff up. At the crime scene of every sin, you'll find pride. So you'll, you'll find that. So anyway, that's a whole different message. Uh, Romans chapter 4, I want you to look at verse 12 because I'm not going to be very long tonight. We have to, we have to deal with one thing, and then we'll, we'll go home. But I, want, I do want to leave you with some encouragement tonight. We have come from ruin, uh, according to Romans chapter 1, all the way from Romans chapter 1 now to Romans chapter 5. We've come from ruin. If you've been here, many of you are faithful Wednesday night attendees, and I thank the Lord for that. We've seen a growth in that, um, and that's a blessing. Martin Luther said this, the, the reformer. He said, there are but two men, Adam and Christ. But two men, Adam and Christ, and all other men hang at their girdles. What did he mean by that? Well, the truth of the matter is that we identify with either Adam, the first man, or Christ. So, I want to give you some things out of Romans chapter 5. Let's look together as we go verse by verse. Look at verse 12. The Bible says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sin. Now, I've used this verse just about every time because you have to almost use this verse to realize that all men are sinners. It's passed upon all men. The first thing is we see the very roots of sin. In this verse, you'll find the roots of sin because sin did not begin with Adam. However, sin did enter into the human race by Adam. Now, you understand that sin did exist before Adam. The first sin that took place was in heaven, right? Pride. You know, Lucifer exalted himself. He saw God and there was that green-eyed jealousy, pride, that he said, I'll, I'll exalt myself and I'll do... Boy, he just kept on. You can read about that in Ezekiel and different things. And he just exalted himself above the throne of God and then he convinced a third of the angelic beings to try to overthrow God. And, of course, God and His uh, power overthrew Satan and kicked him out of heaven and created a place called hell. So hell was not created for you and I. So there was sin, but sin did not begin with Adam, but yet it did enter into the human race by Adam, and sin had entered into the world through Satan. Uh, turn your Bible over to Isaiah, if you would, please. Isaiah, uh, Isaiah chapter 14, if you would. Isaiah chapter 14. I want to read to you some verses. And then, uh, I, you don't have to turn over to Ezekiel, but I do want you to see the root of where did sin come from. Here, here's, here's where sin came from. Here's what Isaiah said, the prophet about Lucifer. He said, How art thou fallen? This is verse 12 of, of Isaiah 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst, Weak in the nations. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. Now notice how many eyes. This is what Lucifer said. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregations in the side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Now notice how many eyes was in those verses. Sounds like to me that Lucifer had an eye problem. Where does an eye problem come from? Pride. So, uh, I'm not, you don't have to for sake of time, but Ezekiel chapter 28, notice what, what, again, Ezekiel the prophet said in verse 11, as Ezekiel 28 verse 11, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon uh, the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord of God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden. Well, who was in Eden besides Adam and Eve? Lucifer. Satan. Every precious stone was thy covering. Are we talking about an ugly being? 
Every precious stone, think about that, the topaz and the, and the, uh, and the ruby and all the beautiful stones that we see, uh, the emerald, uh, these were put in Satan, Satan or, or Lucifer rather, an angelic being. Uh, he was, notice what it says uh, in verse 13, uh, was thy covering the sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the, ox, uh, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and the and gold, and the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes were prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. So Lucifer was a musician. The pipes, the organ, he was probably the musician leader in, in, in heaven. And then he says in verse 14, Thou art the anointed cherub, which there was only three, Michael, Gabriel, and Lucifer. Well, Michael and, and Gabriel still exist, and they're messengers. We see them through some, the New Testament. But then we see Lucifer, one of the three cherubs. He said, I have set thee so, thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. Iniquity was found in Lucifer in heaven. What iniquity was that? It's pride. How many of you has learned that for the first time, that sin did not start on, on earth, it started in heaven? Hey, you know, and by the way, a lot of people believe, well, what was the first sin? Well, Garden of Eden. And by the way, that's the general consensus. That's what a lot of people believe. And that's what a lot of people think in their mind. But sin started in heaven. By the way, why is He creating a new heaven? For that very reason. Now, hold on. I, and I believe that. And then He says this in verse 16. Uh, but the, by the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence. Thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up. What's that mean? Lifted up. Prideful. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of the brightness. I will cast thee to the ground, and I will lay thee before kings, that thou may behold thee. Thou hast defiled the sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of the, thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee. I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. So he's going ahead and telling them his future. They that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. They shall be a terror. Never shalt thou be any more. So we see the roots of sin. We see that Adam, though it did, wasn't the first sin, it did enter into the human race, but it entered into the human race by Adam. God had clearly instructed Adam what to do and what not to do. Uh, turn your Bible to Genesis chapter 2. I want you to see this earthly sin that we have experienced from the garden. See what, what God told Adam. We're going to find out the roots of sin. Genesis chapter 2, and I want you to look at verse number 15. Genesis 2 and verse number 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Now this is the command of God but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Does that sound like a suggestion? Does that sound like a maybe? No, when God commands something, you can take it to the bank. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. It is the real deal. If you eat of that one tree, you're going to die. And death by sin. Regardless of God's command, Adam ate of the forbidden fruit. He transgressed against God's command and he died spiritually 
that very moment. The very moment that Adam fell is the very moment that he realized, I'm naked. I've sinned. God told me not to do this. God told me not to, you know, Eve was beguiled. Eve was convinced, deceived rather. She ate of that fruit, but Adam willfully fell. There's a difference. Adam knew better. God told Adam. Sometimes we say, yeah, that old woman, she's the one that messed it up for us. Not according to the Scripture. It was Adam. Man, I'm sorry. We can't blame the woman. She's the weaker vessel, right? Adam should have said, no, I'm not. God told us not to do that. But he willfully fell. We see the roots of sin. I love the book of Genesis. It's a great book. Notice the, the next part of that, that. We see the results of sin. I'm not sure how far I'll get, but I want you to see this verse because it is a very important verse. The Bible says, Wherefore as by one man sin into the world... And notice verse 12. And death by sin. And notice this phrase. And so death passed upon how many men? All men. All men. Just like a child that inherits the nature of his parents, mankind inherited the fallen nature of Adam. All of us did. Adam's where the human race was ruined uh, there was an opposite of what the devil had promised Eve, the old liar. He assured Eve that she would not die. If we were to go back to Genesis chapter 3, you don't have to. But here's what the devil told Eve in Genesis 3 and verses 4 and 5. He said, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes will be, shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You know what the devil does? He takes what God tells us and twists it. Oh, see, if He just told us a bald-faced lie, all of us would say, Nope, that ain't, I can see that from a mile away. But the devil knows better. So what's he do? He, just, he knows the Word of God better than you and I do. So he just takes what God said and says, Hey, let's just twist them words around. You're not going to die. You're actually going to know as much as God. You're going to be a God. You're, you're, you're going to be up there. You're going to be all wisdom. You're going, to, you're going to know these things. And boy, He can make it sound good, can't He? Hey, that one little puff on that drug's not going to be that bad. That one little shot's not going to be that bad. That one little drink's not going to be that bad. That one night over there is not going to be that bad. Come on, man, live a little bit. I know what God said, but you know, He just don't want you to experience the fun. The pleasures of sin is fun for a season. Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 1, the Bible says that Satan was more subtle than any beast of the field. He was a subtle creature. He, he was subtle. Meaning that he was so conniving and deceiving. and That's what makes Satan so powerful today is that he is so subtle about it. You know in here that there's just some things that you should not do. I mean, you know that. But you know what? A lot of people are so deceived. Who's the deceiver? Satan's the deceiver. The Bible says that he can even transform himself into the angel of light. That's what Paul says. Transforms himself into the angel of light. So when it comes to business of deception, Satan is the master deceiver. Either he's the old serpent or he's a beautiful angel. He can be whatever he wants to be. He can be a beautiful woman at work. Fellas. I heard about a young man this week that I love very much. But all it took was one lives in a distant state. I've known him for years. But on a business trip, he met up with someone and they were taking some training together. 
just took one attractive woman. I don't know why I did it. I do. It's all it takes. One click of an internet site. One drink of something. One shot of something. One night somewhere. You say, Who, why did I make that mistake? Because the old devil is a liar. And you think you're going to get away with it. Be sure your sin will find you out. He's a deceiver. So we see the results of sin. He can take the ugliest sin and make it sound so good. And Eve listened to him. And it was the beginning of the ruin of God's creation. All the sin that we commit can be traced back to Adam and Eve because of they, they're, they're eating that forbidden fruit. Then we see the reality of sin. Let's look at that verse again. The Bible says... Wherefore, as by one man sin into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, notice this, for all, for that all have sin. All have sin. So we see the reality. What Paul is saying here is that when Adam sinned, we sinned. That's the nature. When Adam fell, we fell. When Adam died spiritually, we died spiritually. Paul is driving back the, the, the fact that uh, we have an inborn sin nature. We're born with it. That's, we, there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, we are born in this world with the sin nature. It is not something that we have to develop. It's already there. Right? Babies are so beautiful, but guess what? They're sinners. You don't have to train them to be a sinner. They're a sinner from the, the factory. Amen. So were you. So were me. Listen, we're all sinners. I was reading a commentary the other day by a, a, a man on, on Romans. I believe it was Donald Barnhouse. I'm not sure. He, he was probably the best commentator on the book of Romans. But there's a quote in there from a report by the Minnesota Crime Commission that clearly demonstrates what Paul's talking about here in Romans. I want you to listen to this. I thought this was so interesting. This is a, the Minnesota Crime Commission. This is what they say about the human nature. Listen to this. Every baby starts life as a little savage. He is completely selfish and self-centered. He wants that. He wants what he wants when he wants it. His bottle, his mother's attention, his playmate's toy, his uncle's watch. Deny him this is, these things and he seethes in rage and aggressiveness, which would be murderous were not he so helpless. He is dirty. He has no morals, no knowledge, no skills. This means that all children, not just certain children, are born delinquent. If permitted to continue in the self-centered world of his infancy, given free reign to his impulsive actions to satisfy his wants, Every child would grow up a criminal, a thief, a killer, or a rapist. That is not a Christian commentator. That is the Minnesota Crime Commission. How does a man get so violent and wicked? He got whatever he wants. It's in all of us. How does that make you feel tonight? Every one of us was born with a sin nature. And that's a vivid truth. We are not sinners because we sin. Instead, we sin because we're sinners. That's just what we do good. Every one of us, we sin because we are sinners. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Isaiah said it this way in Isaiah 64, verse 6, But we are all as unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Look at verse 13. We see the reality of sin, but we also see the reign of sin. Verse 13 says, For until the law was sin in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Look at verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned, after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. We see the reign of sin. See, once more Paul goes back to before the law to prove that 
his point. He has already proven that men were not saved by the law. We know that. He adds here, by breaking the law is not what brings death. He says, death reigned, in that verse, from Adam to Moses. There was no law, but there was still death. Death is the result of Adam's sin, and we inherited the sin nature. Uh, Romans chapter 5, look at verse 15, the first part. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be, what? Dead. Paul explains the remedy for our sin by contrasting the work of Adam with the work of Christ. Now I find this very interesting because when Adam sinned, every man died spiritually. Notice the present tense. Notice this phrase. For if through the offense of one, many be dead. Notice that phrase again. For if through the offense of one, many be dead. So many physically are alive, but spiritually they're what? They're dead. First, uh, uh, First Timothy chapter 5 and verse number 6. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. That's what Paul said. You can be dead, but still alive. A lot of people walking around today dead, but they're breathing, they're, they're living. And when the Bible speaks of death in this context, it's referring to spiritual death. It is called the second death. Where do we find that? Well, you maybe could write these references down, but we find that in Revelation chapter 2. We find that in Revelation chapter 20. This is not just referring about going out here and dying and, and being buried. This is talking about hell, sin. Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, we're all by nature the children of what? Wrath. That's what we are. When the Bible speaks of death, it's referring to that. We're the children of wrath. And Jesus said in John 3, 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. So in order to have life, we must believe on the Son of God, right? It's, it's only two ways, two roads. Either you choose the way of life and believe on the Son of God. One of my favorite verses. I love it. For he that believeth on the Son hath life, everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. Okay? So if you don't believe on God, you don't have life. But hold on. It gets worse. But the wrath of God abideth on him. So not only do you not have life, not only are you spiritually dead, Brother Lee, not only is the Spirit of God not living within you, but you go to hell. Only two things. Either you believe on the Son of God and have life and life more abundantly, or you reject God's Son and you go to a devil's hell. Paul says much more the grace of God. Look at that verse, verse 15. And the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. So in contrast to Adam, Jesus Christ is the deliverer of the doomed. Adam brought guilt by Jesus. Or Adam brought guilt, rather. But Jesus, He brought grace. So, Adam, He brings the guilt of sin, right? The guilt of death, the guilt of wrath. We were guilty by nature, but Jesus, He didn't bring the second Adam. He didn't bring guilt. He brought grace. The grace of God. Hey, I thank the Lord for that. Uh, he brought grace. So, please take note of the wording here. Paul says, Much more the grace of God and the gift of grace hath abounded unto many. Boy, I love that. Unto many, not just the Jews, not just the Gentiles, not to, to the Greeks or the barbarians, but it, it is to many. That grace has been extended. I love that. The grace of God, which is the basis of our justification, is contrast to the sin of Adam. Grace is greater in the quality and the greater in the degree than Adam's sin. So we're... Where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. Grace is bigger than your sin. It's bigger than my sin. It's bigger than your fall. It's bigger than your guilt. Grace is greater because of Jesus. 
In Adam, we got what we deserve, condemnation and guilt. But in Christ, we have received much more of what we do not deserve, mercy and grace. Look at verse 16, and this may be, I think verse 17 where we'll stop this evening. Notice verse 16. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. So this is another contrast between Adam's sin and Christ's gift. Adam was one offense that brought judgment and condemnation to man. However, God's grace exceeds and abounds to many offenses. Notice that word in verse 16. Many offenses. That phrase, Adam brought eternal death, but grace brings eternal life. Y'all see the contrast? Adam brought death and guilt and wrath. Jesus brought grace and mercy and life. Verse 17, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the, and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, comma, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. The only way. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. What is that name? Jesus. Jesus. Paul contrasts the reign of death with the reign of life. Adam's reign in the Garden of Eden was very brief. I'm not sure how long it was, but it was a very brief reign. When Jesus put him the overseer of Eden, we don't know how long it was before he sinned, but however it was, that was the extent of his Reign After Adam sinned, what happened? Death reigned. He was actually kicked out of the garden. That's what sin will do. It will kick you out of things. It will kick you out of life. It will kick you out of peace. Amen? The fifth chapter of Genesis reads like an obituary section in a local newspaper. It is like a walk through a cemetery when the tombstones reveal the results of Adam's fall. It reads like this, And Adam lived, and he died. And Seth lived, and he died. And Enos lived, and he died. And Canaan lived, and he died. And Mahalalel lived, and he died. And Jared lived, and he died. And Methuselah lived, and he died. And Lamech lived, and he died. You see the result of Adam's reign? Death. He brought ruin to God's creation. That wasn't God's original intent. However, Jesus Christ brought restoration to a fallen man. To the which Adam lost through the disobedience, Christ redeemed through His obedience. Notice this phrase. Look at verse 17. Paul said that we shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. In Adam, our life was one of bondage and hopelessness. However, when we're in Christ, we reign with Him and He reigns over death. You know what Jesus said in John 11? I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in Me, though He were dead, yet shall He what? Live. What a great promise. Why? Because of Jesus. For the believer, death is the enemy that will be destroyed. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 25 and 26, For He must reign till He hath put all enemies under His feet, that the last enemy shall be destroyed. The last enemy, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians, verse 26, chapter 15, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is what? Death. But it will be destroyed. No more funerals. No more people going to hell. One day, it will be destroyed. 1 Corinthians 15, 55, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Not only do we positionally live and reign with Christ now, but the day is coming when we shall reign with Him literally. I mean literally, we'll reign with Christ. Adam brought us into bondage, but guess what Christ does? He sets us free. Adam brought bondage and imprisonment and sin. Jesus brings grace and peace, life and freedom. 
2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 12 and Revelation 22, 5. You see what I mean? Uh, what Paul, just in these five, six verses, we should leave encouraged tonight. We can see the danger of sin. We see the root of sin, the reality of sin. We see the reign of sin. We see all these things. And, and Paul summarizes what he has been saying and Paul contrasts the judgment that came upon all men with that free gift that is available for all who receive it. Uh, verses 18 and 19, you can read about... Uh, I want to get to verse 20. Let me just read verses 18 and 19. It says, Therefore, by as the offense of, of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all, upon all uh, men unto justification of life for as by one man's disobedience were many made sinners so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous we know one man being Adam the other being Christ verse 20 and, and this is it moreover the law entered that the offense might abound but where sin abounded grace did much more abound that word much more abound carries the idea of super abounding super means to surpass by far. That means that it wasn't just a little bit more grace than the sin. It means way beyond. Much more. Isn't that good? Immeasurably. It speaks the fact that God's grace it exceeds. In Ephesians, Paul says, Ephesians 1.7, In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of His grace. Think about that. The riches of His grace. We may not ever know what it is to be rich on this earth with wealth, but we can know what it is to be rich in grace. Isn't that good? I'm rich in grace tonight. You can say that tonight. I'm rich. I'm rich. I'm rich in grace. 